Good evening. We are live. Welcome to uh, this webinar organized by uh, Liber uh, Europe. My name is uh, Yanis Tsakonas and I am acting uh, director of uh, the Library Information Center in the University of Patras in Greece. I will be your host for uh, uh, today. Uh, allow me also to uh, introduce the three speakers that we will have and to uh, give some brief uh, information about uh, the seminar. First of all, we have Sophie Vanstrom uh, from Stockholm University Library. Sophie is an analyst in the library there and a member of the Open Access Working Group of LIBER. And Wilhelm Wittmark is the library director of Stockholm University Library. Uh, he has served uh, the LIBER uh, organization for many years as executive board uh, member and uh, chair of the Innovative Scholarly uh, Communication uh, Steering Committee. And then we have Irena Kutsma, uh, who is Open Access Program Manager of EIFL, which stands for uh, Electronic Information in Libraries. And uh, the three of them, we, they will share with us the, uh, their experience and their knowledge on how we can uh, uh, cultivate an open uh, science uh, culture in our organizations. So first of all, some uh, notes. The webinar is being recorded. I hope that everybody is fine uh, with this. Everybody who participates will receive a link to the recording later today. So all uh, webinars of LIBER are being recorded and then shared to uh, uh, the community. The slides are already on uh, Zenodo. You might uh, find, you can find the link in the uh, chat box that uh, there is available to you. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box so that later we can uh, ask them to our presenters. Uh, uh, as in other uh, webinars, you, your mic is not enabled, so you will be able to uh, submit your queries uh, through the chat box. And uh, I will be responsible to transfer them to our speakers. So uh, a couple of things about LIBER, although I suspect many of you uh, already know what LIBER is about. We are uh, the largest network of research libraries. We want to emphasize on this network aspect because <coughs> we believe that it's a term that uh, highlights how we cooperate together in order to change collectively uh, the policies, tools, and infrastructures for the benefit of open access and open science in our institutions, the broader mission of LIBER is to enable uh, the research of our institutions and by extension the growth uh, and knowledge. Uh, we have more than 440 libraries and LIBER was established around 50 years ago. Uh, as you might know also, LIBER uh, has uh, a new strategy that started in 2018 and until 2022 we would like to reach the following goals. First of all, we want open access to be the main form of publishing. Our research infrastructures will be participatory, uh, tailored and scaled to the needs of diverse disciplines. Uh, research data will uh, be fair, which means findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And we believe that the cultural heritage and the preservation of our cultural heritage is uh, our responsibility right now, right here. And we also think that uh, uh, the research landscape has to have more uh, uh, better digital skills, both for librarians as well as for uh, our researchers. Now, Open Science Roadmap is uh, uh, the document that describes better how uh, LIBER feels uh, about open science and how we can reach open science. There we uh, believe, we say that we believe that every library, uh, despite how big or uh, how small is, can do something for open science. Therefore, we're not asking ourselves 
if we can do something, but how we can do things and promote open science. So today is uh, an opportunity for uh, everybody to learn from libraries and library organizations how we can do it. And of course, we believe in the cultural change, and these are uh, four very simple advices that uh, we have described in the Open Science Roadmap to use training and advocacy to foster common understanding, to ensure that our institutions have an open science policy, to reflect our commitment to open science across all services and to share inspiring examples. I will not uh, 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 go further than this. I will give uh, the speech to Wilhelm Wiedmark and uh, every one of our presenters will have uh, around 10 minutes uh, and then we can uh, take uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janus. And we will take examples from Stockholm University and Stockholm University Library, how we have worked on open science. And uh, I think the most important when you are at the library, it is to work with the university management. Here I can present the uh, president of Stockholm University. And she will also be one of the speakers at the Liber conference that, that she will speak about towards open science from a president's perspective. So she's always communicating on what's happening in open science. So I think that Stockholm University is the most driving force in Sweden for open science. And then you really have to work within your organization to make this cultural change. We have policy documents from the government as well. In Sweden, within the research field, we got a message that we will have a transition to open access in Sweden. And the goal is that the transition will be within 10 years. We think that it should be much faster but it's really important to have policies from the government as well, work with the government. St uh, Janice said that you should have policies. This is one part of our policy for open data. It's Stockholm University advocates the av availability of its research and research results through a research and education environment that promotes, encourage, and inform about open science as a practice. And I think policy is one thing, then you have to live with the policy. You have to be out to the different institutions and talk to the researchers, the students, and the doctoral students about open science as a practice. We have also other governments directive to help open science go uh, further on. So the National Library of Sweden got an assignment to work for cooperation of open access to scholarly publications and the Swedish Research Council got for uh, cooperation for open access to research data. And a lot of different groups in Sweden are no, now working for these directives. One of the most important players, I think, is the Swedish Rector's Conference, SUHF. And you really have to talk to all the rectors because we have to be make decisions together. In 2016, I was at the uh, Rector's Conference and said that open science is not a library matter but libraries could help in building infrastructure lobbying and education open access should be a question at the management of the universities i think we couldn't drive things without having the management with us it's really important that the, the question is at their table and i can say now in 2018 all the rectors in Sweden has open science on their test, as a task at their table. 
uh, in 2008, and we had long discussions with the negotiations with um, Elsevier, and that was really negotiations on how can we drive open access with Elsevier. We got an advice from the Rector's Conference to cancel the agreement. So negotiating transformative agreements, it's something that we're doing together in Sweden at the Bibson Consortium. And then we always had to talk to the Rector's Conference. And it's really hard because it's a new market. All the publishers have different business models. We are working on pilots. Negotiations takes a long, long time, longer than it did before. And then we get shorter agreements because we don't want long agreements in a shifting world. There, you can say when we work together within Libra, the five principles of open access negotiations is really helpful. And when we all over Europe and other places use these principles, it gets even easier. All the publishers know that we talk about the five principles from Libra. Probably you know that we cancelled Elsevier nearly one year ago. We have now discussed with Elsevier maybe to start negotiating again. again. But this has been really a way to communicate at all the universities in Sweden why we are doing this, why we strive for open access, talk to researchers at all the universities and had the rectors to blog about the cancellation. So I think this was really an important way to make cultural change, to break something that people never thought you can live without Elsevier. So the lessons learned so far from that cancellation is that support from the vice chancellor is extremely important. You need to have political backup. We have had it during the whole time. Preparation discussing, communicating, then you have to have control over your own data because the publishers won't give it to you. A communication plan is of course needed. Then we can see now researchers seem to manage fairly well without our Elsevier and they learn a lot about the discussions about open access and we can help our researchers with different services but another lesson is never underestimate your opponent because Elsevier has really tried to talk to different rectors. And I say it's really good that we are united with the rectors and the founders in Sweden to go forward for open science. Over to you, Sophie. Thank you. Uh, and uh, so while Wilhelm has been talking about the top-down perspective, I will focus a little bit about the bottom up, about the actual practitioners. What are people doing? And in this example, uh, we can look at science as a situated communicative practice. Um, that's a, a sociocultural uh, theoretical framework for thinking about how culture is nurtured in different networks. And in research, there's a lot of networks out there. Uh, academic journals can see be seen as a a type of network where people come together and discuss important issues within their subject area. But also the learned societies, the conferences, and a diverse uh, uh, plethora of online spaces in different uh, ways. So for us as a library, it's important to think about how we are positioned in this communicative practice. Where do we come in? How can we help and foster and nurture this cultural change that we see is needed because no decisions in the world can make an academic do exactly as you want them to do. They're gonna do what's best for them and they should be uh, allowed to, of course, because it's their research and they are, they are the experts in knowing how to deal with that. Uh, so one of the uh, other frameworks that we have been using at this library is this, uh, it's a, an image that helps us think about how to expand the horizons of users. So the researchers in the, is in the middle, they know what they know, of course, uh, 
but what we want we want to nudge them towards what they know they should know but don't have time to think about for example that's quite common but also what they don't know that they should know we have a lot of expertise that could be helpful to them if they only ask us uh, so what we need to think about as a library is to communicate Kate well and make ourselves available uh, to design these good science spaces where researchers can be nudged towards becoming more open. You have to make it easy to be more open if that is the goal. Uh, and uh, we have to make ourselves more available and that's something that we have tried a lot at Stockholm University. We have uh, separate ticket queues for just open science questions. We have put together teams that can work with, for example, research data. Uh, and uh, they are learning together with the researchers about the best practices here. Um, however, we also know that there's a lot of knowledge out there that people need to be able to share and to make these informed decisions that we want them to make. Uh, uh, the, there's a lot of information that we know here at the library, like file formats and metadata to make uh, information accessible across the board, but also about copyright and uh, correct references to make sure that this new open space does not infringe on copyright or um, uh, nurture plagiarism or other practices that we don't want them to use. Uh, we also want to help people understand how to describe content because just putting an Excel spreadsheet out there is not good open science. Good open science is if you talk about this is the context in which I collected this data, this is how you can be using it. Uh, and this is something that we have learned while talking to researchers is very important but also that we need to set up some kind of framework to check the quality because what we make available in the open science uh, platforms is there for eternity or oh, well until internet ends but we don't know when that is uh, so the quality assurance is really important and we hope to be able to play a role there as well so knowledge is one thing providing knowledge but how do you really influence the cultural change well, there's, of course, a number of ways we can do this with. Uh, you saw the framework from Lieber that Janice showed at the beginning, and, and we have adopted quite a lot of that. Um, uh, what we do is to uh, realize that people are rational, especially researchers. They will do what seems easiest in every given situation, what gives them a fast return on investment and what is not too complicated to learn. Uh, so uh, we need to figure out how to create a mix of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation to do and become a more open practitioner. Uh, we had to talk to people, quite a few people actually, because people are not looking at information boards at every time. They're not looking at newsletters. We need to get out there and talk to people. And that is a time consuming and takes a lot of resources, but we are trying to work together as a library as well. One example on how we do that is that we have collected something called the Open Science Forum in our library, which uh, is a cross-sectional uh, meeting once per month where we discuss news and updates and ideas on how we can evolve open science services. And this has uh, proven to be very uh, fruitful because all of a sudden we share knowledge between us and uh, we talk about who we, uh, what kind of issues we addressed and problems that we that are arising, systems that are working or not working. Um, and this is also something that we need to show people. We need to show them evidence about what is working. Um, and showcase these good examples and talk to them over and over again. We also need to make people trust us so that we, when they come to us with their queries that we will take care of them and deal with them seamlessly. We have noticed that that really makes a change. Uh, one way on how, uh, uh, one example how we have done this is to set up a team that works with uh, supporting researchers to publish open. Whether or not in a transformative agreement, we give them opportunities to publish open access um, as far as we can. And there's a dedicated email list where people can uh, just say, hey, I got my manuscript accepted. Can you help us uh, figure out how to pay the bill? And then the team are uh, 
elegantly taking care of them, answering all their questions, and then sharing back how, it, how this is all managed. We also collect information about all this and can make reports to uh, show people how their practice is making a change uh, in the greater hall. Yeah, Elsevier is not included here mm -hmm. because uh, if you want to have your fee paid for, it has to be in a fully OA journal or in one of our agreements. And we use the money saved from Elsevier to spend That's on right. open access with all publishers. Exactly. And we try to make a point of that so that we show them that we are using the money wisely. We're not just uh, throwing the Elsevier money away. And that is actually creating a lot of good uh, sort of information streams about this. People see the reason why we cancel the contract because they can see what happens afterwards. Uh, and the, the agreements that we have are mostly the central consortia agreements uh, and they are increasing. We have two new this year uh, with Cambridge and Oxford. Uh, but we also have our own uh, library agreements directly with Stockholm University Library with some fully OA publishers like PLOS, Copernicus, Frontiers and MDPI um, to provide an alternative um, using the money wisely. Uh, we have also collect, uh, made a, a collection page where all the uh, agreements are listed, how there's instructions for research, is the more than welcome to look at it. Um, to make it easy for them to interact with us and understand how their decisions plays a role. Another way on how we try to make it easy is also to collect a website, which is not actually at the library website, it's at the uh, support website for all university staff. And we try to, uh, we had long discussions, but try to uh, show them how uh, the different parts of working re research data uh, plays together that you need several different things in order to share your data and, and think a little bit before you do to make sure it's done wisely. Um, so he, this is an example of how we try to communicate uh, the joint services uh, and by this create some kind of cultural change. Um, so and we also uh, have collected a few um, frequently asked questions so we have readily made answers that we can quickly send back to to authors and editors who are asking us uh, this is a lot a lot of text but you can you will see the presentation afterwards where you can click the links and see what kind of advice that we provide for researchers so that was all i had so now we're open for questions no or? irina oh irina sorry <laughs> yes Hello, thanks for inviting me to join this discussion. And uh, I would like to talk about uh, open science training. Uh, our foster aim is also to influence uh, cultural change towards open science. And uh, we believe that uh, we can do this with uh, offering uh, offline and uh, online uh, training, uh, especially to early career researchers. And for those of you who don't know FOSTER, uh, it's uh, a project with a number of partners, uh, including Liber and uh, others. Uh, and you can see our URL here. And we have a collection of uh, reusable uh, training materials. Uh, uh, when we started, uh, we came up with uh, taxonomy for open science training materials because we thought that uh, that might be a good way to navigate uh, training materials and resources. Uh, but then uh, when we evolved as a project, uh, we were thinking that maybe taxonomy is a little bit boring for early career researchers. And then we came up with an idea of pages and learning paths uh, as a way to navigate uh, open science training materials and also to encourage uh, early career researchers uh, to join online training. Uh, what we currently have uh, is uh, a set of uh, 10 uh, free open uh, reusable uh, courses about uh, different open science topics uh, and uh, when we're developing them uh, we collected 
brought in questions from researchers and we tried to provide discipline specific advice. We worked with our disciplinary partners, uh, CRG um, in Barcelona, Center for Genomic Regulations for Life Science, Sciences, uh, Guesses uh, for Social uh, Sciences, uh, and Daria for Humanities. Uh, and we also have um, tried to have an interactive content uh, and uh, some quizzes. And we were really happy when we received uh, a lot of comments and reviews from community when we were pre-releasing these courses. And um, a person who completes uh, a course and uh, answers a quiz receives a badge. And uh, if uh, that person collects uh, a number of badges, uh, then uh, she could receive a certain specification, uh, specialization, for example, uh, open peer reviewer or reproducible data sharer or reproducible researcher or open innovator or open access author. And um, for example, if you want to be a reproducible research practitioner, you have to complete a course about what is open science, uh, data management and sharing, open access to publications and some other courses, and then uh, get this specialization. And we think uh, this would be more interesting and uh, engaging for early career researchers. Sir. Uh, we also focus on uh, training the trainers, and uh, we organized uh, Train the trainer boot camps. Uh, we have one going on now in Salamanca for Spanish and Portuguese speaking participants at uh, our partners, Mini University and uh, CISIC in Spain are, are organizing. And we have uh, three more boot camps coming up uh, um, in uh, April in Lithuania, in, uh, in The Hague with uh, Sazdar and Alexi Rendans, and also in Serbia. But uh, like with uh, online courses, which anybody can take and uh, download uh, a SCOM package uh, inter Moodle or other e-learning system, same with uh, training the trainer format. Uh, we try to describe it as uh, do it yourself, train the train event. Uh, and uh, there is a link uh, on my slide uh, which explains you how you can do your own train the train uh, bootcamp uh, using our materials. And also, a huge help for us was um, an open science training handbook. And uh, it was developed uh, during a book sprint where 14 authors uh, came together and wrote this book in just five days. And some of those authors, Edith and John, and maybe and Vaso, and maybe some others are here today. And uh, they can tell you more in the chat. So basically, um, it's, uh, it's a, do a living document uh, that exists in uh, English, uh, Spanish, uh, and it's been translated into French, uh, Greek, and we're also talking about some other languages. Uh, and uh, it gives uh, short introductions to different topics of uh, open science. And then uh, within each topic, uh, it explains what it is, why it's important, what are learning objectives, uh, uh, what are most commonly asked questions and uh, points to further resources. And also it has uh, quite useful chapters on uh, how actually do your training. Uh, and uh, we also try to collect uh, different examples of games and uh, interactive exercises that could be used uh, at these uh, training events. Uh, we also compiled uh, some of the recommendations uh, from over 100 training events uh, that were organized uh, online and uh, offline uh, in this document, which is called Recommendations on uh, Open Science Training. And um, for research institutions that would like to implement open science training, we designed uh, a short roadmap which basically says that uh, ideally every 
research performing institution uh, should uh, embed uh, training models uh, with specific focus on practical skills into ongoing educational programs on regular and standardized basis uh, from as early as possible. And of course, such training should be tailored to different research disciplines. Uh, then uh, it's also important if uh, an institution encourages uh, open science skill uh, acquisition. Uh, so it's not only um, up to early career research, it's not only up to PhD students to attend these courses, but it also their supervisors and researchers should support them um, in, in this and encourage them to do so. And also it's important if an institution could recognize and reward open science skills. And um, one of the challenges we are currently having, because we say that we try to influence culture change here, but how can you actually say that you're making a difference? How can you prove that you're uh, making a difference? Sir? And um, what we are currently doing, we are following up with uh, early career researchers who attended our um, training events sir, six months after those training events and we ask them um, for simple questions whether they applied knowledge and skills they gained sir. if no why didn't they apply them and if yes sir uh, what changes did they make to their practices sir, and what kind of impact sir, training had on them and uh, I would very much like to hear your advice what what else can we do to try to capture this kind of culture change. So I'll, I'll end up with a question to you if you have any other suggestions or recommendations, sir. And I'm passing over to Yanis. Thank you. Thank you uh, all three for the um, uh, presentations and of course for keeping uh, uh, the schedule. Actually, we are ahead of our uh, schedule. And uh, we have time for questions, and actually many questions have um, arrived. I will try to be, uh, let's say, concise, and um, I will start asking first Irena uh, about um, if you think that open science uh, can create better researchers and actually, you know, uh, make... Uh, research get better. This is a, a common issue um, when we say open science is like science, like but better, you know. Yeah, we can say that open science is the same science, sir, just more efficient, sir, because you can get sir, feedback sir, earlier on uh, and uh, you can ma you can make improvements sir, while you're still working on, uh, on your results, sir. So I think we are all in the agreement that uh, it, it, it helps. Of course, we should be careful about not sharing sensitive data and uh, there might be some other issues, especially with I don't know, medical research. Uh, but overall, I think open science benefits everybody. Mm -hmm. Great. Then uh, I would like to ask, ask Wilhelm, who, who is in an executive uh, position, uh whether they they have implemented either in stockholm university or in sweden in general a framework for assuring the quality of open science no we don't yet have a framework to ensure the quality but we are discussing it all the time i think we now quality is really important but we have to still work on the different questions and make it quality but we don't have a framework for it you could say that the the uh, sorry if i inter interject but you could also say that the for example the website that we showed with the collected information about open research data that is a kind of framework because we set the agenda by making that information available but it's not set in stone yet so mm -hmm. it can be changed Okay, then, then Sophie, I have a question for you. It's about those uh, open science uh, fora that you 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 hold in um, in Stockholm University. Yep. The, was this within uh, the library for the Stockholm University in general for staff or uh, other people uh, 
in the research uh, field of uh, of Sweden? Was it a close or a, an open event? Is it? Well, it's uh, kind of closed, but also open. We started um, as a group within the library to encourage people or colleagues that are maybe a little bit hesitant towards whether or not their uh, particular work uh, tasks is related to open science. So we wanted to create a safe place for staff to share knowledge and to not be afraid to ask questions. Um, however, there's nothing said that we can't expand those horizons in the future and invite other people. Uh, we've just done a test run now and we will evaluate that together and see uh, if there's any any other opportunities. But, but first and foremost, it was to uh, sort of group us together as a library without, you know, selecting certain working groups. But everybody in the library is invited to those uh, forums and can ask questions. Mm -hmm. And then we have had open lectures in the library at the scene of the library where we have filmed and put out on the internet on different aspects of open science. So we have made it open for some is only in Swedish, but some is in English as well. So yeah. all the questions debated is open from Stockholm University. We had a debate about the Plan S a couple of months ago that was open spread for the world. So we yeah. try to live as we pray <laughs> uh, yes uh, and also about the open science those open forums is also where we get informed about new things that we need to do knowledge gaps that we need to fill so they're really important for us to not only work with for ourselves but to also open up for other voices okay i will use a figure of speech to ask you again both of you actually uh, about this apostle post-apocalyptic world, I mean, the, the world after the cancellation with big publishers, and we have seen many institutions and many, uh, some nations to, um, uh, to, to start cancelling with, mainly with Elsevier. And um, you mentioned that there are no uh, big negative effects to the Swedish research um, researchers. And uh, this means that there are only benefits from this cancellation. And why are you starting again to uh, negotiate uh, with them? And why you haven't extended these cancellations with other big uh, publishers? Well, I can start to answer. Yes, we see it is really... It, have been mostly positive effects of the cancellation with Elspir. I think that uh, our researchers in Sweden find their articles. There is no problem for them to do it. The libraries have really tried to help them. But I think we still have to have discussions with Elspir because if we look at where are our researchers publishing, and today many are publishing with Elspir, then we need to talk to us. How can we make all publishing from Sweden open access? So it, we will never get take a bad deal from Elsevier, but we will still have discussions with them because we think that they have to change their business. Then in the long run, we might need to have other platforms and working other ways. But today we still are dependent on where our researchers are publishing and we need to help them to be do it in open access. Yeah, and it should always be their choice where to publish. We should never tell them that. Um, that's very important to stress as well. And then you asked about if what we will do with other publishers. We are negotiating with many publishers and if all the publishers know now that if we don't get a deal that we want, we can cancel. So I think we haven't had to cancel yet with another, but I'm not sure what will happen in the future. Mm -hmm. Great. So I will um, return now to Irena, asking her if she thinks that open science can affect uh, positively, of course, uh, economy and uh, growth in, uh, in in some countries. I know that EIFL is uh, focused on developing countries. So maybe you can tell us a little bit uh, about the benefits of open science 
on uh, very, very practical things like economy. Well, I think yes, sir. And uh, here in Europe, one of the rationale behind uh, open science policies is to actually compete economically. Uh, and uh, it's the same rationale uh, in Africa or Southeast Asia, where with open science, uh, small and medium science companies uh, could have access to latest research results uh, and uh, can actually innovate because uh, they will have opportunity to collaborate uh, with each other and also with other partners uh, and we'll also see that uh, so maybe it's it's not so much uh, like direct economic effect but uh, in uh, neglected uh, ne neglected medical uh, disease research uh, open science uh, is, is already a common approach uh, with projects like uh, open source malaria and uh, also others uh, so i'm yeah i'm really optimistic that uh, it makes a difference sir. okay so i will return to to wilhelm asking that uh, you know if from the higher level of uh, uh, managing all these open science issues you are working with uh, new generation metrics alt metrics as part of the research evaluation of uh, of the swedish uh, researchers Yes, we have to look at all kinds of data, how to evaluate what's happening. So we work with health metrics as well and other things. I and mean, we can't be dependent on only citation analysis and things like that. So it's one part of open science to start look at different metrics, how to evaluate what's happening. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I can also maybe add a little bit to that. Uh, when we were developing topics for our open science training courses, we also wanted to focus on uh, research assessment and evaluation and uh, alternative metrics. Uh, and we didn't have time to do this yet. Uh, but uh, we just had uh, a training, open science trains a training event in Ghana. And uh, that was one of the topics that uh, our training participants specifically requested. Uh, so we'll try to come up uh, also with a short course uh, on uh, new approaches to research assessment and uh, evaluation uh, for early career researchers as part of our open science toolkit, because uh, I, I also believe that that's, that's an important topic. Okay, so Irena, can I ask you if, how you evaluate the interest of of many colleagues around the world to translate the open uh, science training handbook in their languages do you think that you know uh, um, the cultivation of uh, uh, a cultural change is uh, is better if you do that in your native language i mean is that fruitful do you think well, for example, Spanish translation uh, is, is a good example because uh, ECLAC, which is uh, a library in Chile, approached us to co-translate uh, our open science uh, training handbook uh, into Spanish because uh, they felt that uh, it would be easier for them to use it uh, in Latin America. And uh, same with Portuguese translation. Uh, Portuguese team works with Brazilian team to come up uh, with a version uh, in um, in their language. Uh, for French, uh, it's part of uh, French National Open Science Plan, and um, it's it was also important for them to offer materials uh, which are easier to and quicker to read with uh, specific examples from um, these countries, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, a little bit of a technical question addressed to Sophie. Um, there are two distinct movements right now in open access. One, we have Plan S, and then we have the uh, big publishing agreements 
Uh, so these two things, they are not seem, you know, harmonized and uh, um, in the same direction. Uh, how do you see those two movements working together and uh, whether our researchers can get involved in uh, giving input uh, to support these initiatives? Because we know that many open access publications have been funded by projects and these are not always, you know, let's say controlled by libraries or, cons or consortia. Well, um, I don't necessarily see them as two things. If you see it from a user perspective, it might not be two things. What do you think, Willem? No, I really think that if we now are talking about transformative agreements, and I think that is from Plan S before we talked about offsetting deals and things like that. So when we are talking to the publishers, we say, okay, we make a transformative deal with you. We want, this is the last deal we make now within the current situation. After 2024, you should be open. So I think you combine those things. You try to drive the publishers to move towards open access that way. So in that case, we really, I think it's the same question. We need to, work with the publishers to flip their journals to become open access. Then we have to work on other projects as well, for otherwise we will be dependent paying the publishers. We have to make new arrangements and try to take control over the quality control of research within the universities. I agree. And, and there are also other alternatives, like uh, we have workshops on looking at open educational resources and we you talk to researchers there and they don't see it as different things for them it's a, it's sort of a the same area uh, they use the same tools they think about the same frameworks so i think we will be moving more and more towards a sort of a more unified view on this rather than having the different stakeholders staking out their own space okay now irena could you answer if you think that uh, researchers are more uh, difficult to be persuaded to make their data open uh, and uh, do you have any uh, ideas how we can let's say uh, fight this reluctance that they have to uh, open their own uh, data and support this cultural change I well, you know, from my perspective, uh, I don't really see a strong opposition from researchers uh, towards opening up data because uh, there is no real market for for data. There are no publishers uh, approaching researchers and offering exclusive publishing agreements. Uh, so from my experience, uh, researchers who have uh, useful uh, data with potential for reuse uh, are willing to share it. Uh, of course, the question is when you share. Uh, many of them would say that they wouldn't share it until they publish their paper and then they would share afterwards. But uh, I guess that's also a learning process for, for us and for, for researchers to show them uh, benefits of uh, making data available as early as possible and then uh, being invited to join research projects or write research articles collaboratively. And also adding up to previous uh, coalition S and transformative agreement discussion, uh, I think it's, it's important to remember that uh, there is no single transaction uh, in every open access publishing agreement, we, at least in Europe, but also actually in Africa. There is already a strong market of uh, open access publishers who don't charge article processing charges. Uh, and I think it's, it's important to remember and uh, highlight that uh, non-APC publishers are here and uh, they have good business models and uh, they should be supported by libraries as uh, libraries are signing 
deals and agreements with uh, publishers who charge APCs. Uh, and uh, in open air projects uh, in which I'm also involved, uh, we recently had uh, a workshop with non APC publishers uh, in Bielefeld and we'll be publishing materials from, from that workshop. So I think that's, that's important to keep stressing. I think that the question about research data, it's much more complex. It's much more decisions for the researchers how to do it. And I am a little bit more afraid that the publishers will try to gain a lot of money on the research data as well. Today, many uh, journals, they have things that you have to publish your data. And if we don't have the infrastructure at the university, they just say, okay, you can have it here and pay us again. So I think it's very, very important that all universities work with and nations work with infrastructure for publishing data. Otherwise we will end up paying the publishers for that thing as well. Yeah, and also introducing more or less similar research data management policies uh, in universities. Uh, and, yes, uh, in, in our policy, we say that we shouldn't give away the data to the publishers. It says in the data handling policy at Stockholm University. Yeah, yeah, and it, yeah and one important aspect is also that research is not national, it's global. Uh, so we see most big research projects are not from one nation, but from several. So we need to align, I think. Yes, and then I think it's very important to start to talk to the doctoral students. I had a lesson ago yesterday with the, the, all the doctoral students in chemists and talked about both open access and open data. They are the researchers for the future and they need to have it within their course from the beginning, lessons about open science. I think it's really important to start with the doctoral students. And also research data management policies are very important for universities from the global south, uh, because uh, unfortunately it's quite common when uh, these universities are invited to participate in joint projects and then um, this all issues of data ownership somehow remain with uh, researchers from the global north sir. and uh, this is one of incentives and, and reasons for universities in the global south to have research data ma management policies uh, in place uh, stressing co-ownership aspect and uh, highlighting uh, universities responsibility to keep the data, make it available. Uh, and I was very happy when we were writing uh, a master plan for the University of Yangon, which is a major research institution in Myanmar. They uh, mentioned that they uh, will have research data management plan uh, in place uh, very soon with uh, data availability provision. So I think uh, that's that's a good example. Mm -hmm. Okay, so research data management is a is a very big issue, and um, thankfully we have a very um, a strong working group in Liber, and they organize many webinars, and we can address all those concerns uh, to them. I will uh, ask the uh, last two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, the one goes to Sophie asking if she thinks that um, uh, practices of, on, of open access uh, from a researcher is a prerequisite for uh, open science. And this, let's say, signals how committed is a researcher to open science. Well, yeah, I would say so, because some then you tap into an area where they have some knowledge. They know a lot about publishing. And if we can nudge them towards open publishing and see that that works, I think it, they will also see the, uh, the benefits of a sharing culture also in other areas like learning material and data. Um, so if we, if we start with something small, I think we will reach the, the goal at the end. And we have some time as well. So don't rush people into making hasty decisions. We should also take bear in mind that not all data can be shared. So we need to find other ways than on explaining 
how why we're not open uh, and give a lot of support in helping them explain that. Was that a good was that an answer? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think yes, <laughs> uh, but I'm not the one who is supposed to answer that. So that's uh, I say I guess. So there are some comments already landed about the previous questions, and uh, can I ask you because I know that uh, all three of you have Twitter accounts. Maybe you can answer them afterwards somehow, and yeah. uh, people can uh, go to Twitter and uh, see your uh, follow-up uh, answers. And uh, there are several links. Uh, there is, of course, the Open Science MOOC, uh, which works nicely in parallel with Foster. And uh, the last question: uh, First, I would like I, I, I would like that to be uh, answered by Rena and Wilhelm. First, by Rena, of course. Uh, how long it takes for somebody to develop an open science? culture uh, because this doesn't happen you know overnight it takes some time and uh, uh, first I would like Irena to answer that so we, everybody can uh, dwell on that and then uh, Wilhelm who is working heavily on this well it's it's a difficult question uh, now it takes uh, a lot of time but I somehow believe that uh, if we find convincing arguments and if we approach uh, researchers really early and if we have support from uh, PhD supervisors, uh, uh, we can have a uh, majority of current early career researchers practicing open science because it's really, it benefits them, it, it benefits society. So I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, with uh, resources, materials, uh, approaches, good practices available now, we all of us could do this quicker. I really think that the open science move, um, is moving fast now. The cultural change will take a lot of time in different at different universities, different nations and things like that but i think we can see now that it has started moving it is important that we do things like this share different things we have done at different universities in an open environment but i think cultural change you can never say that you have one country cultural change then you have to start again you will always have to work with the culture yeah it's contextual yes and uh... If we live as we learn, maybe we can reach some level at least. Great. I would like to thank everybody who participated in this uh, webinar. First of all, I would like to thank the audience, uh, the almost 100 people who I attended this, and then our three presenters, uh, Sophie, Irena and uh, Wilhelm. I would also, of course, like to uh, thank the Liber Office for uh, giving us this uh, opportunity and the means to, to hold this um, webinar. As we said, the link will be shortly available uh, for, uh, for you to watch again uh, this webinar. Of course, you can share it with other colleagues who were not uh, able to uh, attend. Uh, and we are looking forward to uh, seeing you again in a conference, in an event, or another webinar uh, by Liber. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Janis, to keeping this together. Really good moderator. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Bye. 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 Bye.